send an aroma before we get to the point of the Star Trek food computer where you just push a button and we can send people their coffee. So <laughs> yeah. Yes, better than MREs, right? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Well, is my camera on? They caught me drinking coffee. So uh, I think that's why it's coffee chat, right? Coffee yeah. chat. Well, you can drink coffee and chat. You can't do both at exactly the same time. So I'm going to stop drinking coffee and welcome everybody to our February 9th coffee chat. Welcome to the second week in February. Hard to believe that we're already there and we haven't had any snow yet. So fingers crossed we might get away with it this year. Uh, my name is Matt Smith. The screen tells you who I am, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, I'm your host here at Economic Alliance this morning. For those of you that are our regular customers, thanks for coming back. And for those of you who are first to the coffee chat, we hope you make this a, uh, I don't want to use the word habit, but a regular occurrence. Um, certainly it's all driven by what topics you find of interest. And that's our, that's, that, that burden is on us to come up with topics that people are willing to chat about. So far, we've done a pretty good job. So this morning, it's a very timely topic, given what we've all been through for the past almost a year. That's another thing that's hard to believe. And so to uh, lead us through this coffee chat, um, we have two subject matter experts this morning. Uh, the first is Dr. Camus Milam, who is the chief medical officer with Compass Health. And excuse me, but I'm gonna read this because I don't wanna miss anything. She's been there since October, 2017 and is responsible for all Compass Medical Services and their integration with other clinical and social service functions within the organization. Welcome Dr. Milam. Uh, with Camus is Kelly Hatfield, who's the CEO and owner of Advantage, Absolute Advantage, my apologies. She's been in the leadership recruiting and HR field for over 25 years. Along with her business partners and teams, they have created three successful HR-related businesses aimed at matching exceptional talent with top organizations. Both are valid and valued EASC members. So let's get this show on the road because I'm adding no value at this point. Dr. Milan, the show is yours. All right. Thank you, Matt. Yep. And thank you all so much for inviting me to speak with you today. And it, it gave me the opportunity to meet Kelly and uh, for us to learn a little bit about each other's work before we shared it with you. So for starters, I want to tell you just a little bit about Compass Health and our recent efforts. So a lot of you might know that Compass Health is a community mental health center. Uh, we have offices in Everett and Linwood and several smaller, more specialized offices around Snohomish County, uh, as well as the other four counties of the North Puget Sound area. Uh, we work exclusively with Medicaid or Medicare Medicaid uh, individuals, and mostly with people who have serious mental illness, although we do do some counseling only services as well. Uh, we provide specialized behavioral health services for all ages. So in addition to integrating counseling and medication therapy, we also have intensive wraparound services for children and youth, as well as adults, residential treatment facilities uh, with durations of one to two years and permanent supportive housing. In just a couple of months, we'll be opening 82 new permanent supportive housing beds at a beautiful new facility on our Broadway campus. And then hopefully in early 2022, we'll begin work on phase two of three of building on that site uh, to create an integrated healthcare facility for individuals with serious mental illness there at the gateway to uh, downtown Everett. Uh, so over the past couple of years, we've been really thrilled to some, forge some new relationships and partnerships with the uh, WSU School of Medicine, and more recently with the CMAR Family Medicine Residency Program to train new young physicians for the North Puget Sound area in whole person health. Additionally, we maintain the practice of providing clinical preceptorships for nurse practitioner students and for counseling interns. And we're really looking forward to opening more opportunities for other healthcare students to learn more about community mental health and, and integrated healthcare. 
Uh, our major focus over the next few years is, years is to continue the ongoing process to create hope and promote recovery by advancing whole person health. We do this by improving care coordination and using evidence-based best practices to provide the uh, best integrated care possible to those we serve. So that's a little about us. Um, as you can imagine, mental health self-care is and has been of major concern to us here at Compass Health. Like everybody else, we've scrambled over the past year to understand and to ameliorate the unprecedented impact of the first pandemic in 102 years on our patient population and our staff. In the first couple of months of the pandemic, as we were watching and understanding this, the Washington Department of Health reported a 20% increase in domestic violence as well as steadily higher increases in alcohol and marijuana tax revenues, which have continued, meaning we're all finding our own ways to deal with this. Uh, the state has also seen an increase in background checks for handguns over the past few months and rising numbers of youth suicides, which has led to a more recent increasing concern for adolescent mental health. We began to respond to this almost a year ago now by increasing our telehealth services 100 fold to continue to provide service to those whose lives had become more restricted and were unable to actually come into the office for their uh, appointments. Uh, and at the same time, we had all the same concerns that all of you in business uh, have likely had with finding adequate personal protective equipment to protect those in our workforce who, who were essential and who had to be out and interacting with community members. And, and while we at Compass have seen certainly higher levels of distress and anxiety in the individuals that we work with who have known mental health issues, there's also a lot of new mental health and behavioral distress in, in people who are dealing with the added stressors due to the pandemic. And that's where I want to go and Kelly will follow on a, a little bit more. Um, it's true, you know, not only in our own communities, but nationwide. Um, in mid-August of this past year, uh, healthcare professionals learned that data from a voluntary online mental health screen, which was released by Mental Health America, huge foundation, had found a dramatic increase in depression, anxiety, psychosis, and suicidality. As of the end of June, more than 169,000 additional participants had reported having moderate to severe depression or anxiety as compared with participants who had completed the screen before the panic. And the biggest problems actually that we're seeing are among young adults um, up to about age 25, 26. Then interestingly, as we've watched this pandemic go through a separate cross-sectional study of more than 100 adults who had COVID-19 illness found that depression and anxiety may actually be an effect of the novel coronavirus on the brain itself. Um, the CDC has reported that depression and anxiety were correlated with the central nervous system, that means brain basically, symptoms that included the loss of smell and taste but not necessarily with the respiratory symptoms like shortness of breath, cough, or with fever. And that, what that means is that any of you who've ever had a bad cold or have had the flu and know that it makes you feel different in your head and that you don't function as well mentally, uh, that's what it's talking about. Um, psychiatric symptoms were also significantly correlated with taking longer to recover from coronavirus. Experts have begun to discuss an echo pandemic of mental illness and suicide that may come as a wave after in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, and one scientist at George Washington University described the combination of economic, social, and health threats all occurring simultaneously as the equivalent of getting hit by an earthquake, a tsunami, and a famine all at the same time. And I, I'm sure that feeling is not unfamiliar to, to many of you there. Um, there's a lot of conversation that's gone on amongst my colleagues in, in healthcare and mental health care and, and friends and about how we're all thought, feeling burned out. And I imagine that many of you have found yourselves using that term as well. But, so what actually is burnout and, and what can we do about that? 
Burnout is a term that was actually coined in the 1970s to describe an exhaustion of body, mind, and motivation due to exposure to prolonged and unresolved work stress or frustration. So it doesn't come from things happening in your personal life, but rather from your work life. Recent studies actually suggest that as many as 75% of us in the workforce have experienced burnout since the pandemic began, no matter what our, our positions in, in the workplace. Um, so how do, we, how do we see it? How do we know when somebody's suffering from burnout? Well, one of the first things that you might see is snapping at coworkers, uh, micromanaging and people who were, were not micromanagers to begin with, um, becoming fixated on small details. As leaders, we may experience feelings of negativism or cynicism about our jobs and a sense of a loss of focus and, and a loss of mental clarity that can lead to reduced professional efficacy. Burnout doesn't have to do with the number of hours that you work, but it has more to do with that feeling of having stress that you cannot resolve, that you can't find an answer to, something we can't fix. Uh, in the healthcare fields, we often experience something that's similar that's called compassion fatigue or secondary traumatic stress. And healthcare workers who've been on the front lines um, and working with those who are affected by COVID-19 have experienced this emotional and physical exhaustion that leads to a diminished ability to empathize for, with or feel compassion for others you know, just, just at a time when, when that's what a lot of people need the most. Uh, and I, I imagine that many of you uh, have experienced life stressors that have become more severe day to day in these trying times. Now when, that we've got entire families stuck at home with work, school, family life all taking place in the same space and often simultaneously at the same time. Uh, the routines and rituals that we fashion our life by and that help us separate the different spheres of our life are, are lost. Uh, worry about friends, absent family members, elderly people, um, finances, learning for those of us who have school children, all of those things that, that we've all encountered over the past year can feel all consuming. So what happens in our brains with all of this unrelenting stress that's been going on for the past year and doesn't necessarily show huge signs of letting up? Uh, the limbic system, which is the part of the brain that's associated with the emotions, and the stress response and chronic stress, that part of our brain becomes more alert and sensitive during prolonged stress. This is also the part of the brain where post-traumatic stress syndrome lives. So that hyper alertness in the limbic system in turn causes a prefrontal cortex right here behind our foreheads. It's the executive part of our brain, the, the super ego, the I should, I shouldn't, et cetera part. Um, to work less effectively, and, and even we can see it shrink on MRIs as a, as a result of chronic stress. Okay, imagine what happens then. That results in mental fog, um, decreased problem-solving ability, and a decreased creative capacity as well. So we add it all up. I think hopefully that can all this brief history through the brain can lead you to see that, that our own well-being needs to be our priority if we are successfully to navigate and, and help uh, those who, who work in our industries and our families and those that we serve to successfully navigate this pandemic. So how do we take care of our mental health? Well, I got to be the one who tells you mostly the part about, uh, about how it works and Kelly will tell you more about that, but it, it is a tough thing. How do we do that without feeling that we're letting others down? Uh, really what we need to have to see us through times of disaster, uh, and this has been, this is nothing new, but we need to be resilient. Resilience is a process. It involves behaviors, thoughts, actions of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, and threats. Most of us tend to think of resilience as something one either has or doesn't have, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, resilience can be developed by focusing on purpose, connection, and flexibility. 
internal strengths and external resources are both important in developing and maintaining resilience. So the key to attaining resilience in mental health is self-care. Uh, like that airplane announcement when we used to fly on airplanes that we used to not really listen to in case of emergency, put your oxygen mask on first. Modeling that self-care in the workplace can help not only you, but also your direct reports and your colleagues. And the same, of course, is true in family and social life. So what goes into self-care and developing resilience? I'll give you a couple of three quick tips to keep in mind, and then Kelly's gonna lead us all through an exercise and some take-home ideas. First of all, it's important to remember our North Star, understanding and living our personal shared and our company values is more important than ever because it's the driver of resilience, innovation, and, and ethical leadership. We must take time to be aware of what's meaningful to us and to check our thoughts and behaviors and actions regularly against those values. Secondly, and I cannot emphasize the importance of this, is to have someone to talk to. Uh, historically, it's been taboo for leaders to express vulnerability. And that leaves many of us in a really lonely position in difficult times. Finding someone to talk with about our well being and emotions helps to sustain performance, health, and happiness. If we do so on a regular basis, we're more able to manage challenges as they arise. And it, it doesn't have to be a therapist, although it can. It can be a therapist, coach, a mentor, or even a peer, a coworker. Uh, and therapy can actually be a treat. And after all, it's someone who listens to you non judgmentally for an hour about whatever you want to talk about. And finally, uh, we need to be aware of toxic positivity. This is the assumption that despite a person's emotional pain and turmoil, one should have only a positive mindset. You all know the phrases, um, we're not given more than we can handle, this will work out for the best, and, and so on. So remember that it's okay to not be okay if we pretend that emotional pain doesn't exist, if we're smiling all the time and saying we're fine, it actually invalidates that emotional state and it can send a message to the brain that emotion is, that that particular emotion is bad or it's dangerous and it causes that limbic system to go into the fight or flight response. By overdoing positive affirmations to others, we may be invalidating their feelings, and that can cause harm when a person is already in a vulnerable state. And the ultimate effect can be to perpetuate the stigma that mental health issues equate to being weak-minded and incapable. So what do we do to create resilience to weather the storm when all these bad thoughts that I know that I've had, and I imagine that you have too, and, and feelings come up despite our best efforts to push them away? Well, the best way to actually handle negative thoughts is not to push them away, but to name them, to recognize them, to let yourself feel them, and then to let them pass through you. It's really, really important to remember that an abnormal emotional response to an abnormal situation is normal. There's a lot of resources around. I sent Kelly some, uh, sorry, sent uh, Katie some of the uh, the easiest ones where you can find some things to share with coworkers. Um, and we have a, uh, a webpage on our Compass Health website, uh, our COVID-19 webpage, Caring for the Whole Person Through COVID-19, that has some good tips on it as well. So I will stop there and turn it over to Kelly. Thank you. All right. Woo -woo -woo. Thank you. Let me, I am going to share, I put together just a little presentation here. I thought it would be fun and more interesting than looking at me. Um, so let me pull this up here real quick. All right. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Awesome, okay. So let me move my little pictures around here. Excellent. All right, so, um, you know, again, uh, Camus, thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to kind of piggyback off of what you just shared. My name is Kelly Hatfield. I'm the founder of Absolute Advantage Leadership. And at Absolute Advantage, we provide high performance training, leadership development, and consulting to companies who are committed 
to building more engaged, productive, and high achieving teams. So um, a few months back, we did a presentation for EASC that was around turning survive into thrive. So we gave a ton of tips around stress management and I'll make sure that I provide that uh, prior presentation to Katie so that she can send that off to anybody who's interested or maybe even it goes in the thank you email. But we gave so many tips and, and um, Camus just great, gave some great tips as well. But how do you develop the habits necessary to overcome burnout and COVID fatigue? You know, it, it seems easier said than done, right? We, we know some of the things that we talked about in our last presentation, we're getting outside and going for a walk, exercise, you know, gratitude, you know, finding the joy and, you know, and, and those types of things. And so we know a lot of the things we should be doing, right? You know, but, but why aren't we doing them? You know, and, and we all start out with the best intentions. And then before we know it, we're at the bottom of the bag of chips, <laughs> so to speak. So, um, you know, if you've ever struggled to achieve a goal, build healthy habits or create lasting change, it's not your fault. You know, and that's what I'm here to talk with you about today. Let me, um, two seconds, let me get this moved over. Oops. Minimized here, there we go. All right. So understanding the science and the fact that you can retrain your brain to finally get the outcomes you desire is like a weight being lifted off your shoulders. And I don't know about you, but for myself and most of our clients, there's this nasty pattern of self-loathing and shame that comes along with trying to create a healthy habit and then not being able to stay the course long enough to reap the benefits, right? You know, it's degrading and it slowly chips away at your confidence and makes the original issue you were trying to resolve worse. So understanding the science and how your brain works is the key to breaking that vicious cycle and finally creating the habits to help you achieve anything that you set out to do. You know, and again, staying on this topic of, of uh, stress and, you know, implementing those healthy habits. So we do a workshop and, and have an online course that obviously goes much deeper into this, but I thought I'd give you a little primer here and something you can implement immediately to start getting, um, you know, to start creating healthy habits. So for the next few minutes here, we are uh, going to enter the nerd zone. <laughs> I say that with all due respect as a nerd myself. So I'm gonna shed a little light on um, how your brain works. And this is simplified, like Camus has got the true science and the, the education and everything behind it. But I'm gonna give you the layman's um, kind of, of how your brain works and then how you can use that knowledge to create healthy habits. Oops, bear with me here. So let's, uh, your brain has two priorities. So the first is safety and that's basic survival. So emotionally, physically, and mentally. And then your brain's second priority is efficiency. So because your brain is responsible for all of the functions in your body, you know, from breathing to thinking analytically to, you know, blinking your eyes right now, processing the information that I'm sharing with you, because it is responsible for all of those functions, it has to be extremely efficient to get it all done. It needs to conserve energy in order to do more with less. So your brain relies on familiar behaviors that can be implemented with very little energy. You know, so I would um, like, so think about brushing your teeth. You don't even think about doing it, right? It just happens automatically, you know, well, hopefully. <laughs> but it's just part of your routine, right? Well, this is where the concept of autopilot enters. So because your brain has so much to do, it goes into this autopilot mode. And the autopilot mode is really a collection of habits, behaviors, ways of thinking that we've acquired over time through our experiences and input from external influences. So um, as a matter of fact, at least 95% of our daily thoughts and actions happen subconsciously without even thinking about it. You know, so um, back in the days when we all used to drive to work, you know, um, have you ever driven to work and not remembered getting there? Like 100% on autopilot, you know, I have. This is an example of exactly what we're talking about. This is your brain doing its job. And it's why you keep getting the same results, not once, not twice, but over and over again. And it's, and it's also why it's so hard to create new habits. 
So now that you know how your, that your brain is designed for survival and efficiency, there's another important fact to understand about your brain. It's threatened by change. Remember, its job is to keep you safe. Um, so for example, your goal to lose weight may seem exciting and inspiring to you, but your brain, that ancient brain for, you know, designed for survival, wants to keep that weight on in case there's a famine around the corner. You know, or the idea maybe of leaving your job to, to go to a new job or start a new business you know, might fill you with excitement, but your brain worries that the loss of your current job and income could lead to starvation or some other negative impact. So to your brain, almost any change you wanna make is interpreted as a potential risk, you know, emotionally, financially, you know, physically, mentally, and socially. And all of this leads to the same dilemma every time. Setting goals isn't hard, achieving them is hard, because as far as your brain's concerned, radical change is a potential threat. So that you can see left to its own devices, the brain will keep you in that place of complacency, comfort, and safety, because really that's its default programming, right? So as I mentioned earlier, one of the brain's main job is efficiency. Well, think about how much information you take in in a day. Your brain has to process everything you literally see. So everything optically coming in that you hear and that you feel. And it has to run your body, you know, regulate your hormones, process everything that you're hearing right now. I mean, the list goes on. Our ancient brains haven't evolved as quickly as technology has. So it's often in this state of overwhelm and overstimulation. Now, now even more so. I mean, as a matter of fact, we process more information in one day to day than we did in, the, in an entire year, the year I was born, which we won't go there, but it was a while ago. So really think about that for a moment. Your brain is on overload. Without clarity, without a clear focus and path forward, your brain doesn't know what to focus on. So it guesses based on your old conditioning and patterns, and, and it relies on that autopilot. So to get your autopilot working for you rather than against you, there's one more really important thing you need to understand about your brain. And that's your reticular activating system. To put it simply, this is your brain's filter. So I want you to really think about your reticular activating system as the filter for your life. Your, and I'll refer to it as RAS here for the rest of this. So your RAS is like Google. So there are millions of websites out there but you filter out the ones you're not interested in simply by typing a keyword, right? Or think about ad targeting. As technology starts to understand the things you're interested in based on what you're browsing or buying, it sends more of that and filters out the other stuff. Well, your RAS works exactly the same way. So the messages that get through your RAS are pretty much the ones that, you're cur that are currently important to you right now. So, um, you know, think about that. If you're watching a lot of news, you know, if you're, you know, the things that you're letting in, um, you know, that are currently important to you, that's, again, what your RAS lets in. So, for example, if you're, pro if you're focused on preparing for a speaking engagement, then your RAS is going to filter in the thoughts that are going to make your presentation a success, you know, such as the tools and resources you'll need to deliver a memorable speech. You know, or, um, you know, I had a conversation with a friend of mine, really, um, right along the, the topic of what Camus was talking about earlier, which, you know, she's been thinking a lot about her mental health and her ability to focus, you know, and was either even wondering whether ADD, you know, was something that she should consider or talk to her doctor about. Well, lo and behold, she starts seeing all this stuff in her feed related to ADD. She's seeing commercials everywhere. You know, um, she's picking up on things in conversations. You know, and, and we joked a little bit about Big Brother watching, you know, what, you know, listening in on us, but more than likely, it was her RAS filtering in the information that was top of mind for her at the time. You know, or another example would be if you're in the market for buying a certain type of car, then you'll see those cars everywhere, right? So why is this important? Your brain will look for what you tell it to look for. If you aren't actively influencing your RAS to achieve the life you desire and create those healthy ha habits, you'll never get there because as I mentioned earlier, your brain just has too much to do and it'll rely back on that default programming, the programming meant for safety and efficiency. 
So I wanna give you a little tangible and visible example here. So how many times do you think you've seen the FedEx logo in your life? A hundred times, a thousand times? Well, when the founders of FedEx were designing the logo, it was important to them to include some key elements of the values of their organization. So that said, measurement and metrics are an important part of their culture. So what if I told you there was a measuring spoon in the logo to illustrate this value? So do you see it? It's in the, the white space of the small e. You know, so it's facing up, you know, it's like a spoon in the white space of the small e. If I told you that because they started out delivering over the road, um, they wanted to include a tire in their logo to depict their roots and where their company started. So, you know, there's a, uh, what if I told you there was a tire in there? You know, do you see that? It's that round part of the blue D and it's kind of coming off the straight part of the, the D there, the blue D. And so the, the tire is coming out towards you. Another element that was important to the founders of FedEx was to depict that forward motion of delivery. So they wanted an arrow incorporated into their logo. So do you see it? It's in the white space between the large E and the X. So uh, the reason why I wanted to give you a visual here is it's, a, it's really a prime example of how the brain works. You've seen the FedEx logo hundreds of times, but until your RAS knew what to look for, you know, as far as the elements that I just mentioned, you, you didn't see it. So we're, now that you know how the brain works, you know, what now? And again, that was super simplified, but just knowing some basic things about your brain is, is so helpful. So what's the solution? You have to gain clarity around your goals and the healthy habits that you wanna create and revisit that clarity every day so that your reticular activating system can keep those things that are important to you top of mind so that your subconscious mind you know, will strive to reach them and it'll get that autopilot working for you rather than against you. So basically you kind of need to retrain your brain, so to speak. And you can do that with this really simple formula. So clarity plus focus plus rep repetition equals momentum and creating new and healthy habits. So let's just dig right in. This is real, uh, really, um, you know, where the rubber meets the road. Um, so the first portion of the equation is clarity. So what is your goal? You know, and when I say goal and we're relating it back to what Pam has talked about, you know, um, we're talking about creating healthy habits and reducing stress and, you know, what is your goal? And, and in, in, for the sake of this exercise, let's just say that it is to walk outside, walk outdoors 30 minutes a day. There's tremendous benefit to being outdoors, you know, as far as stress relief is concerned and to just movement and forward motion in your body and all of the wonderful effects that that has in, for, in terms of stress reduction. So let's just say that's the goal. So, but first identify your goal. Next is um, what habits do you wanna create to achieve that goal? And I'm gonna give you an example here. So I just, we don't have much time. So I'm gonna cruise through this pretty quick. And again, this will, I'm gonna provide this to Katie too. Um, so you'll get this, I think in a follow-up email if I remember, right. Why this is important to you. So you need to connect some emotion to, to why making this change in your life is important to you how you'll incorporate it. Your brain needs a plan. So, um, you know, again, cause left to its own devices, it's gonna go back into that autopilot mode, that default programming. So it needs a plan and when, so you need a timeline around it. So your goal, I'm probably, I flipped these around a little bit. So what's your goal? Why is it important to you? What habit do you need to create to achieve that goal? And um, how will you incorporate it and when? So let me give you a little example here of a statement I put together that illustrates this. So my goal for the next 30 days is to go on a walk outside every day. This is important to me because I want to lower my blood pressure, reduce my stress, have more energy, and be a better role model for my family. I'll bring my walking shoes and rain gear with me to work and finish fifth, lunch 15 minutes early so I can incorporate my walk into my work day. You know, and then at the end, too, I always like to throw in a statement that just really is about commitment. So I'm committed to living a healthy life. And I'm grateful for all of the things my body is capable of. 
and, and again, tying that gratitude piece in, which we talked a lot about in our last presentation. So anyway, this is with the clarity was the first part of the uh, formula. Focus, now with that clarity, we've given your, uh, here we go. We have given your uh, reticular activating system uh, uh, the ability to focus. Like it can do its job now and filter in the things that are gonna support your goals. You know, that specific goal that you have. And then here's where, what is so important. And this really is the, you know, the crux of this. Again, your brain, like you may have the best intentions. Like I wanna start walking every day. But if that's the last, like in that moment of consciousness where you make that decision to do that, if you don't have a plan and you don't remind yourself of that plan every day, you'll go back into that default mode. So you need to read that statement that you've created every day at the start of the day. So stick it up on your mirror, put it near your coffee machine, wherever it is that at the very beginning of your day, you're gonna read that to, to inform your brain and your reticular activating system of what, you, you know, of what the plan is. And then once you do that and you're doing that consistently, every day reading that, the science begins to kick in and your autopilot will begin to work for you rather than against you. And then once you thought was impossible is now possible by applying science to your life. So it's so basic, but I promise you that, that if you look at creating new habits from a scientific standpoint, instead of just trying to white knuckle it and use your power, it'll get easier and easier to create new and healthy habits and, and really accomplish any goal you, you set out to achieve. You know, that, that walk in the example I just gave will um, become just like brushing your teeth does now. You'll, you'll do it automatically without even thinking about it. So that's my presentation for today. You know, if there's anything that we can do at Absolute Advantage Leadership to support you. So if you're interested in a deeper dive on this, you know, we have a great workshop we've built around this. We've, uh, you know, we've got, um, you know, goal setting, habit building, our online courses. And please reach out if you're interested in exploring any of the employee, uh, employee development leadership training that we have available. We'd love to support you. So with that said, I'm going to turn it back over. Let me stop my share here real quick. Thank you all so much. I guess it comes back to me. So I turn my camera back on. So um, <laughs> yeah. without it, the intent here is not to... Uh, trivialize anything, but I want to say thanks to Camus and Kelly for the Camus and Kelly show. And the reason I say that is we get so wound up in serious issues and viruses and politics and the bad news of the day. Um, we don't take time to think of and look for the good news of the day and try to be happy. And uh, that's part of what I just got out of this is you can make yourself happy but I'm going to lead into Kelly with the follow-up question since you just finished your little thoughts of um, since your brain is a habitual animal, animal, how long does it take for, you can't just read that thing one day at the mirror and say, life is good. So no. is this weeks, months, years, how do you break a hammock that maybe decades? Uh, yeah, no, totally. And it really is dependent, you know, on, um, well, let me give you an example here really quick. So if it's something that's like a natural tendency of yours, you know, it's easier to start to create, you know, a new habit, but, um, you know, so let me just, uh, the, the, the important part to remember here is the consistency and it does take a, a little while. So like I use this, I've used this technique, um, with something specific that I needed to work on as far as leadership was concerned, which was like many of the people who may be on this call um, who are leaders, uh, I would often get caught um, fixing all of the problems in the company and really kind of taking away opportunity from our internal team. Like they'd come in, have a problem, and then I would, solve, I, I would just would go into that solution mode and not give them an opportunity to, and, and develop them and, and you know, so I built this into my routine, which is if I, um, if somebody comes and asks me a question, 
I don't just solve the problem. I ask three questions in return. So like I literally did this exercise um, and you know, it took, I don't know, about a few weeks, you know? So at first I would notice after I'd solved the problem and go, oh, I just solved their problem. You know, and then I would, uh, you know, I would notice it right when I was in the middle of it, like, and then I would start asking questions. And then, you know, it just became second nature, which were as soon as they walked in the door, I would start, you know, uh, I would ask, I would ask questions first before I would even, you know, bring a solution to the table. So, you know, that took a little, that took a little while. Other things, as soon as you start to bring it in your awareness, you'll be like, oh, you know, um, you'll recognize like the walk every day for an example, you know, you'll at first it might be, oh, I missed it today. I didn't go on my walk, but you know, um, you're thinking about it. You're like, oh, I really need to go on that walk. And then soon it just, you're not even, it, it just starts to program. So for some people it's quicker, like it happens immediately. Uh, others, other things might take a little longer. If again, it's a habit that you've been working, it's, it's a pattern that you've had for a really long time that you need to break. And I don't know, Camus, do you have any, you know, other additional thoughts around this about how long it takes to create a habit? There's all kinds of research on this. You know, well, there, um, yeah. it used to be 21 days. Now it's, you know, uh, you know, six months, you know, what are your thoughts? Well, it, I think some too, that, that what you pointed out, Kelly, was that uh, a habit, if it's kind of going against what our brain is already telling us is much, much harder to develop uh, and much easier to fall out of too, like, like that walk. Yep. If your brain's telling you, you need to be sitting at home at your computer working on something instead of that walk, then the first day that you miss it, you might fall back out of the habit again. But you're right. The research out there is, is amazing. You know, and it's, it, the other thing that's really interesting with this too. So, um, you know, let's say that, uh, you know, as far as the, it, it going against your you know, that grain, your, the, the, the walk, for example, isn't something that you, you know, I, I think, um, you know, just again, creating that awareness around it and, you know, starts to bring it in. You can, and if you can connect emotional things to it too, that helps. Um, so anyway. Mm -hmm. and, and we can trick ourselves into things too. Like I, I was really taken by the story that you told about your friend who, who found herself feeling foggy and unclear and having a difficult time and started thinking about, well, maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I have ADD. Maybe I have something instead of being able to say, hey, life is really tough right now and things are hard. Yeah. It's, I just can't. Yeah. It's so, so, so important to acknowledge that to ourselves. Absolutely. Great. Um, I wanted to make sure something isn't overlooked. There was a request in the chat. Uh, that was directed at you, Camus, from Terry Cleveland at Fairfield Senior Housing, wanting to know how she can connect with your organization so that her, her residents are able to take advantage of what you're doing. So I, I sent her something back privately in the chat. Thank you. Very good. That. Appreciate that. Uh, one of the things I got out of the chat and out of this was the need for us to be supportive of each other and not to sit around and dwell on, oh my goodness, life sucks but to reach out to your friends and colleagues and engage them in conversation, because this whole process has done nothing but isolate us from each other. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to not be passive about it, uh, be very forward and say, I'm in charge. I'm gonna, I'm gonna step back in and change what I'm doing. Um, I guess my uh, next question I have for Camus is, um, uh, if they announce next Monday that the pandemic is over, life goes back to where we were or, <laughs> I mean, we've ramped to a certain position in life. We're going to have to ramp back again. So how does that happen? Well, so we wish life would go back to normal. I guess one of the questions is what is normal? Uh, I, I imagine most folks have heard the uh, new normal phrase bandied about quite a bit. Uh, but, you know, it's like we can never unsee this. This has happened. Um, this has impacted us all. I saw a comment in the chat about, you know, kids who, who don't have, kids are, are little pack animals, especially uh, teenagers, you know, and they haven't had their pack and that is, is incredibly damaging to them. So when, if tomorrow we all are vaccinated and coronavirus is magically gone, uh, 
then we still have this trauma that we're carrying around with us. So we have still have this response that over a year has become ingrained in us. And we're still gonna have to do this hard work to, to reach back out, to, to find our joy again, to not be afraid um, to, to, re to grab the joy, to find the joy and to grab it and to, to go for it. And, and, and we do, most of us, and probably on this chat, I would guess that everybody you know, tends to respond kind of like, like Kelly's friend did, there's something wrong with me if I'm having difficulty with this. Uh, and I think that's something we're gonna have to continue uh, working on. Um, something to think about as well is that uh, um, a resource that's out there, I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with mental health first aid, uh, but that is a, uh, it's, it's like a, uh, almost like a peer kind of a thing. It teaches people in, in a typically a four hour class, one time four hour class, how to learn about how to support other people, uh, how to, uh, uh, recognize when someone's having problems and instead of being afraid of that to reach out and to say you know wow this is this is something that uh, that that looks like it's going on with you and you know how can I help listening is a, is a huge amount of helping and being able to reach out to that teenager and say wow it doesn't look like you're okay what's going on so I, I'd highly recommend that um, Mental Health First Aid, it's a nationwide uh, organization and there's classes offered um, by all sorts of trainers all over the counties. Um, Compass Health has a couple trainers. We, we offer those classes as well. Um, in Snohomish County, the uh, Snow Isle librarians all uh, got trained in, uh, in Mental Health First Aid because that's one of the places where people go when they're, when they're feeling badly. So reaching out, recognizing that nothing is normal we're not feeling normal. It's not going to be normal again. Someone passed through the chat there that normal is a cycle on the wash machine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and it's it's not a way of life. Uh, then we can help each other to build that resilience and to find our way back. So, Camus, are there services out there that are directly targeted towards children or teenagers? My kids, everybody's kids, they're all kind of funky and withdrawn and leave me alone. You're my parent. I don't want to talk to you. So it's hard to, it's hard to sense whether this is kind of the normal part of being a teenager or something is seriously going on. But I can assume that if you tell somebody, you know, I'd like you to take a class or I'd like you to talk to somebody because I have this sense that maybe you're suffering a little bit or you're not really feeling right and you need some intervention. Are there services that we could direct the teenagers too, as an example, that would make, help them get past that feeling and make them feel like they're not sick or that it's okay to do this, you need mm -hmm. this help? Well, teenagers, and, and you just pointed that out too, that uh, parents are, are the, uh, part of a teenager's job is to rebel against their parents and become their own person. So when, whenever things are stressful, um, it's, it's really, really tough for a parent to be able to have that conversation with a teenager. And teenagers are more apt to go online and to their social media uh, to find things out. There are, um, there are a lot of online and social media types of resources that can lead teens back to, um, uh, to things like mental health first aid, to um, suicide prevention hotlines if they're feeling that way. And that seems to be the way that teens are, are the most interested in, in reaching out as via that social media. Uh, I sent um, Katie some uh, um, links in the, in the chat that she can share with everybody. There's, there's just so much out there. I, I could spend the next couple of hours naming things. Um, but I do think mental health first aid because it is so basic and it is so focused on just recognizing, understanding, and being able to say things are tough. I get it. I get that it's tough. How can I help? I hear you. That's, that's what our teens need the most is, is to feel that someone hears them and sees them. And the sooner we can get them back in school, then the sooner they'll have their packs again. Yeah, and that was one of the comments from one of our attendees here was the the, the either negative or positive impact of getting kids back into their social setting in schools. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, you really 
you don't control that, the school district does, but there, way, there may be ways to, uh, to kind of work around that. The, um, I guess my, maybe my last question, looking at the time here, is mental health over the past few years has been coming out of the closet in the, to the extent that you know, nobody wanted to admit that there was a mental health issue. And if you went to see someone to help deal with that problem, you typically didn't share that with your friends over a beer. It was kept hush hush. So I'm assuming that one of the positive, not that there's more than one, but a positive impact of coming out of pandemic may be that people recognize that mental health is part of your overall health program. Kind of like good dental health is part of being healthy. Well, good mental health is the same thing. Is the community under-resourced when it comes to mental health professionals? I can find all kinds of doctors to go to for a broken arm or a scratched knee or an infection, but what about, what's the supply chain like for mental health? Well, you're, you're right, it is under-sourced. And a piece of that is because mental health has, you know, we're just now coming back to saying, hey, yeah, the head bone's connected to the neck bone, right? Um, mental health has been separated out and not made available as a resource for someone who's beginning to feel stress. It's something, there's something wrong with you if you have to seek a mental health counselor. Like you said, you don't share that over a beer. Um, and different societies, it's different. Um, if uh, I have friends who live in New York, they do talk about their therapists over their beer. <laughs> if you're not seeing a therapist, there's something wrong with you if you live in New York City. That may say more about New York, I don't know. Um, but I think that yes, it's been a resource, it's not there. And, and again, I mentioned earlier, we, we perpetuate that stigma of saying that you know, by, by pushing this toxic cheerfulness and this, this toxic positivity, it, it creates that message that if you have negative emotions and feelings, there is something wrong with you. Uh, and, and we have to stop that because that's, that's normal. That is a normal human response. Yeah. So Kelly, um, in your world, um, given that so many people are working at home, do you find it's tough to kind of give your pitch about about your message to employers because they're not seeing their employees uh, every day and they don't know what their employees may be going through. And if their business is suffering, they're looking at how do I reduce costs? So, I mean, there, there's value to what you're offering, but I would think like maybe the system is pushing back at you a lot about, right, I don't have time for this or um, I can't afford this. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, I, I would say that you, um, you know, as far as um, I don't have time for this. Um, like it, your employees should be your number one um, priority. They're the lifeblood of your business. And, um, you know, if you, you need to tune into and, and understand what's happening, find ways to connect with your team, ask them how they're doing. Um, you know, it's your responsibility you know, to take care of your employees in my mind. You know, those, the, the companies we work with understand that one of the most important investments they can make in their business is their investment in their employees and in their employees' health and well-being. And, um, you know, so that's our message, you know, and as far as the cost is concerned, the cost of turnover, the cost of low pro productivity, like your return on investment by investing in your employees and in their health and mental well-being, um, like the return on that investment is 10x, um, you know, compared to doing nothing you know, and, and really watching your, your business wither away um, through low production, low engagement, turnover, having to try to real, refill those roles. So, you know, my message for anybody with list, you know, listening here today would be um, just your job as a leader. And I know oftentimes the hardest challenge we have as a leader is, is leading ourselves. But remembering we're role models and the responsibility that we have to our teams you know, that, you know, we're their stewards and, um, you know, we need to be taking care of them. And to the point that Camus made earlier, to do that, you have to take care of yourself too, you know, but, but back to your question, you know, it's, uh, that's the, for April and I, April's my business partner. That's our, that's the message we're trying to get out to, um, to, to companies and to leaders is the importance of getting connected and finding ways to check in with your team and, and understand the extent to which they're being impacted. And 
the next one last thing I would say is that if you in any way, shape or form with the tools that you have as a leader, and if you in any way, shape or form are being impacted by what we're going through as a society and a culture right now, you can guarantee that your team, your employees are going through the very same thing and perhaps on an entirely different level because there's a financial piece and all kinds of other things tied into that. So, um, you know, I just, <clears throat> again, can't emphasize the importance enough of, of you know, um, our duty as leaders to, to be checked in with our teams. And, and let me completely second that. I'm going to steal away the last couple of minutes here. That, 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 is, that is so true. I mean, you made a comment that, well, you know, we're, we're thinking about costs and it's expensive to, to work with coaches and to learn how we can do these things. I can guarantee you that it's going to be way more cost effective to utilize Kelly's services for everybody in your team, that it's going to be to have individuals suffer with about a serious mental illness, which may become longstanding and may become ingrained and it loses their productivity, their happiness, their livelihood sometimes. Um, starting this at the very beginning and teaching people those habits and, and teaching people how to, to recognize, I saw gratitude flipping through there a lot. You know, we talk a lot about gratitude, but again, that's a habit. How do we do this? So, so utilizing those types of services to start in the beginning, that, that can save a lot of really costly and, and prevent medical care down the line. Absolutely. And two, when you're checking in with your team and you're creating that kind of culture too, that community, like I think right now too, and, and I don't know how you feel about this, um, Camus, but it feels lonely. You know, we're more connected than we ever were from a technology standpoint, but feel less, dis but, but feel less connected or more disconnected on an emotional kind of level. So you, you do feel like, oh my gosh, is something wrong with me? Or um, you know, and then you throw social media into the mix and you're comparing yourselves to these people who look like they've got it all figured out, you know, and you're like, oh. you know, I, I, you, so when you've got a community, your team working together on this thing, then they you build a little community and a culture within your organization where everybody's supporting each other, you know, and you realize you're not alone. You're all, ex you, you're all experiencing a shared experience. So. Got it. Well, thank you both for the wisdom and the inspiration this morning. We all need that, um, not just this morning, but every day. So thank you again to all our attendees. Thanks for checking in with us. Make, uh, I don't know if the RAS thing a uh, is, uh, a talks about being at our regular coffee chats, but make that part of your routine is to come to our coffee chats and hear from people like Camus and Kelly, subject matter experts that will help us do what we don't want to do better. So closing this out, our next coffee chat will be 8.30 a week from today, Tuesday the 16th, Tuesday after your three-day weekend, depending on where you work. And you'll hear from Josh O'Connor, the publisher of Sound Publishing, which means the Herald locally, about the future of newspapers. So with that, go off and enjoy, at least for me, blue sky and sunshine. That's what I'm seeing. I hope you all find the same thing and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you.